So welcome everyone to our virtual workshop, Managing Pests Organically in the Garden and Orchard. I'm Luke Freeman. I'm a horticulture specialist here at NCAT out of our Southeast Regional Office in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I'm joined by a fellow horticulturalist, Guy Ames, uh, who specializes in, in tree fruits and um, other fruit crops. We are going to be talking about pest management. Um, Guy will talk specifically about organic principles of pest management and then managing pests in the orchard. I'll finish by talking about uh, vegetable pests for the garden. Uh, but before we get started on the topic, wanted to give you all a brief overview of NCAT and our ATRA program for those of you who aren't familiar. So ATRA is the Sustainable Agriculture Program operated by NCAT. And it's the program that enables specialists like us to provide you all with technical support. We also have a website, atra.ncat.org which is a tre treasure trove of resources on sustainable agriculture topics. We have over 300 publications, last time I checked, um, on wide ranging subjects within sustainable agriculture, everything from organic pest management, like we'll talk about today, to you know, growing crops organically, um, rotational grazing, uh, parasite control and goats, soil management, uh, you can find so many resources on our website, atra.ncat.org. Uh, and also, we've, we've been producing a lot of great podcasts and video content for you all as well. So that's a great resource. I'd highly recommend it. Um, and at the end of the presentation, we'll talk more specifically about specific pest management resources for you to refer to. And so both Guy and I are in our Southeast Regional Office in Fayetteville, Arkansas, but NCAT actually has six regional offices throughout the country. So even if you're not in Arkansas or the Southeast, uh, we might have a specialist near you. We have offices in Texas, California, Montana, New Hampshire, and Mississippi as well. Okay, so today's topic, pest management and environmental stewardship. This grant is funded by I mean, this project is funded by a grant from the United States Environmental Protection Agency um, through an environmental education program. And just to make the connection between the pest management principles we'll be discussing and environmental stewardship, I'm sure you know most of you um, are interested in this topic because you're wanting to farm or garden in a way that is friendly to the environment and is minimizing you know, potential damage to pollinators, to butterflies, um, to beneficial insects. And so the practices we're going to be talking about um, present a, a soft approach, a sustainable approach to, uh, you know, keeping pests off your crops. Uh, you know, this is always a balance, um, ensuring that you have a, a harvest, you know, from your garden or um, from your fields by, uh, you know, controlling target pests, but also minimizing potential uh, environmental damage. And so these principles we're talking about um, really present that uh, environmentally sustainable approach to managing insect pests in your garden or orchard. Before we get started, we want to get a sense of who all is on the call. So I'm going to uh, throw up a poll here on your screen if you're joining us on a computer or a smartphone. Um, I'm launching the poll now. And if you could take a second to you know, click the box to tell us whether or not you're a commercial farmer, a rancher, a home gardener, or a homesteader, extension educator, professor, or instructor, nonprofit staff or volunteer, a student, or you know, maybe you fit in some other category. And feel free to check multiple boxes if you uh, have multiple roles. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that poll and share results. So it looks like most of you joining us today are home gardeners or homesteaders. 
And then we have a decent amount of commercial farmers and ranchers, and also a sizable amount of nonprofit staff and volunteers. Well, thank you all for joining. Uh, this really helps us get an idea of who we're talking to. Now, one more poll before we get started. We just want to get a sense of where you all are located. So if you wouldn't mind doing the same thing, check the box to indicate whether or not you're in the Mid-South or Southeast, if you're in the Southwest, uh, the Mountain West slash Pacific Northwest, the Midwest or the Northeast. So a lot of the recommend recommendations we'll provide in PESC we'll talk about are specific to the Mid-South and Southeast, um, but a lot of these principles will you know, apply no matter your location. It does look like most people joining are in the Mid-South or Southeast. Um, some people from the Southwest, some from the Midwest. So that's very helpful to know. Thank you all. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Guy Ames, who's gonna talk about principles of organic pest management and also managing pests in the orchard. Thanks, Luke. Welcome. Let's get rid of that picture for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we don't have a, a check for that, but I guess you could just think, right? We don't have a, a oh, we do. poll we question. A long do oh, I'm kind of curious. It won't take but a second, and then I'll know who I'm talking to. Of course, we already know that most of you are home gardeners, but um, it's still helpful to know what kind of problems you have. Yeah, so on this poll, if you could indicate which fruit crops you're experiencing the worst pest pressure on. Yeah, not just what you grow, but the ones you're having the worst problems with. Exactly. The options are apples, pears, peaches, cherries, strawberries, brambles, or other. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and that and share the results. Guy, if you wouldn't mind Good. describing the results for our audience. Yeah, so it looks like uh, roughly half of you are having problems with apples uh, and then probably the next largest category of peaches uh, and then strawberries, a lot of other. So uh, maybe we'll have a chance to clear that up during the question and answer period. That's helpful. Okay. And Guy, do you want me to throw up this next poll? You know, yeah, yeah. Let's just do it just in case. I'd like to know, especially vertebrates. Yeah. And some of you, of course, won't know which pest. You know, if you if you find worms, quote unquote, in your apple, you might think it's uh, a worm, <laughs> which of course is not a true worm you might not realize that it's the larva of the plum cuculea or the larva of the codling moth or probably the, or possibly the oriental fruit moth, some other things. Same things with the maggots. Although down in the South where most of you are from, we won't have uh, too much of a maggot problem, but anyway. And if you don't know, that's interesting too. Can you see Angela's question there, Luke? I cannot. Well, if you're still there, Angela, we will be talking vegetables too. We just started with fruit. Okay, so I should have should bug. be able to yes, see the poll results. Bug. Guy, do you mind summarizing these? Yes. Okay. So the plump cuculeo may be more of a problem than you know, but that's okay. We don't need to worry about it yet. Stink bugs, yes, absolutely huge problem for fruit and vegetable growers. Again, you may not know what collie moth problem you're actually experiencing, but uh, trunk borers, again, you may not realize you have vertebrates. <laughs> I mentioned this to you, Luke, we may need a whole other program for vertebrates. So folks, yeah. unfortunately, we're not gonna be talking about vertebrates much today, uh, but I can see that it's a serious problem. Uh, so yeah, we may, maybe we'll be able to put on another one because it's, it's a uh, serious and ongoing problem. Okay, and all those indirect feeders, we call them indirect, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Almost 
more than half of you had those problems. And I don't know, there's some honest people. That's right. A lot of us don't even know what kind of pest problems we have. We don't, you know, and this is part of what we're doing here today. Okay, that's good. Okay. So we're going to talk just a little bit about um, the word organic. Uh, a lot of times, some of you may, especially those of you who are professionals, may have heard the term integrated pest management. And I just want to point out that organic and integrated really at the root mean the same thing. We're talking about whole systems, W-H-O-L-E, whole systems, whether it's an organic, an organism, uh, or integrated into a whole. And the point of that that I want to make is that unlike Oh, the old days, and some of you don't know the old days. I do, I know the old days. Uh, unlike the old days, we really are trying to consider all the aspects. We're not just gonna see a pest and spray. We're not gonna break out the seven dust and boosh and uh, just douse our garden or our orchard with that. Uh, we wanna know a little bit about, and let's start here with the bullet points, knowing the pests. So. Sometimes you won't even know what pest it is, but hopefully we'll begin to help you a little bit. The beneficials, and that's really important because these beneficials may impact on that pest. You need to be able to tell them apart. Cucumber beetle and the lady beetle both have spots, but one's a pest and one's a beneficial. Uh, habitats, if you know the habitat where this pest or the beneficial is living, you know, you can manipulate that somewhat. Life cycles, we'll talk about why it's important a little bit to know something about the life cycles of your major pests, especially if you're commercial grower, but home growers too. And then we'll recognize some of the symptoms because as we've already indicated, you may not even know what pest you're dealing with. So before I go any further, I might as well show the picture here. I hope that everybody's got video, but uh, if you don't, we're showing a wheel bug or an assassin bug. They call it a, a wheel bug because there's a, on the pronotum, just on the back of that insect, it looks almost like a wheel, doesn't it? It's also called an assassin bug, and it is sticking its proboscis, its piercing, sucking mouth part, right through the integuments. You love all this technical language, right through the integuments of a Japanese beetle. I found that on my blackberry. I bet Luke recognized that leaf there. And uh, it's a beneficial, obviously. The Japanese beetle is not. So a lot of stink bugs or uh, tarnished plant bugs, uh, leaf-footed bugs, and this uh, tar um Assassin bug looks similar. You wanna be able to tell them apart. And in this case, it's pretty easy because of that wheel um, on the pronotum. Anyway, okay, moving on. Scouting, this is really important. Scouting sounds somewhat technical. This is what the professionals call it, but we're really just talking about getting out in your garden or orchard and looking around. Observe, see what's out there. Uh, there's an old homily that the farmer's footsteps are the best fertilizer. Well, they're also the best pesticide. Get out there and look and see what's going on. Most of you do that, especially if you're a home gardener, you're out there all the time. But if you're an orchardist, sometimes there's there's a competing interests. It's hard to get out there. Uh, trapping can help too. So a good scout is gonna, especially if you're a commercial grower, you can put out traps and help. You may want some simple tools, uh, an ID, an old identification book for insects. Of course, now there's online services. Uh, I think Luke found this a good app that you can access through your phone if you're out there in the field. Uh, net and lens, you probably don't need that, but sometimes that's helpful. You can really, if you're having a hard time seeing a, uh, a particular pest, uh, you might want that lens to look at it and determine what it really is, if it's a good guy or a bad guy. The net sometimes is helpful too for the same reason. It's hard to get some of these adult forms of our pests that have, are winged and moving around. Now, economic damage threshold. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because it looks like most of you are not professional growers, but the concept is still important. So the economic damage threshold broken down, what that means is the point at which the pest is doing economic damage. So we're talking about commercial growers here, but the concept is still important to you. And here's one of the main reasons why it's important to any of you is that there's always background um, biocontrol going on, biological control. Nature is dog eat dog, cat eat mouse. It's, there's, if, 
if there weren't things like the assassin bug, we would be overrun completely <laughs> with Japanese beetles. There's all kinds of, of naturally occurring biocontrol going on. And if we intervene with pesticides when it's not necessary, we can disrupt that natural control. And so the professionals figured out that don't spray until you know you have to spray. And that's what this economic damage threshold is all about. So I'll give you one example. A lot of you were interested in, in apples. Again, this is not something that most of you uh, gardeners, but we've got a few professional growers out here. This is very important. You're not going to apply a codling moth pesticide, which we have organic ones. We have a codling moth virus, really effective. And we don't need to put that on though until we're getting a catch of five or more moths per trap. They've got codling moth pheromone traps. It, it uh, uh, attracts the female, I'm sorry, it attracts the males. Not that you care probably. <laughs> You're gonna count them the same. And uh, when you catch five or more uh, in one week in this trap, you need to do something about it if you're, especially if you're a commercial grower. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's some inconvenient pest management truths related to organic pest management. And uh, one of the things that's really important to remember is that the pests have to eat too. And the only reason I have to say this is that there used to be a, uh, a popular myth, an um, urban myth, this would be a rural myth, that if you had everything in balance and you put on enough compost or, you know, your chi was good or whatever, you weren't going to have any pests, you know, it's just not true. Uh, you're going to have pests. From the tree's point of view or a carrot's point of view, we might be the pests. <laughs> so remember that you're going to have some pests and it's okay. The pest doesn't care if you're certified or not. You know, if you're a gardener or commercial grower, they're going to be there. Let's also remember that fruit, especially since I'm kind of coming from the fruit point of view, it actually wants to be eaten. And that may take me a second to explain, but remember that the fruit is a carrier for the seed. And so uh, nature has evolved this plant that, let's say, apples, since a lot of you are interested in apples. They've made this fruit, the apple fruit, chock full of goodness, sugars and, and nutrients and such, so that something will eat it and spread the seeds around. So all this fruit out there literally, quote unquote, wants to be eaten. And uh, whether it's an insect or a possum or whatever, all those sugars and nutrients are going to be attractive to a lot of things. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught unawares. You're going to have pests. Okay. So unlike diseases, which we're not going to be talking about much here, we may talk a tiny bit about uh, insect vector diseases, but basically unlike diseases, there's little genetic resistance, resistance to insect and mite pests. And um, I, I'm a nurseryman on the side. I specialize in disease resistant uh, fruit varieties. Very little resistance to insect and mites. Uh, among apple varieties, for instance. There actually is some important ones, though, with root stocks, and probably we'll get around to that. Uh, should go without saying there's no silver bullets, but we all want one. And uh, yeah, we've come kind of close, it looked like for a while, with the surround is the name of this kale and clay product. And I think we're going to be able to come back to that later. But uh, that's as close to a silver bullet we'll probably have in organic agriculture. So let's just say this too. Here's another one of these big time uh, inconvenient truth. Organic pest management is gonna require more of you. You can't just spray a broad spectrum pesticide. You're gonna have to know more about, uh, you're gonna, uh, your pest. You're gonna have to be identify the pest. You're gonna have to uh, get out there and observe and see what you've really got. Uh, you're gonna have to be quick. You're gonna have to be, this flexibility and nimbleness uh, means that, um, because a whole lot of these pesticides, organic pesticides, have a real short activity period, you've got to be able to react quickly. And then if you're a commercial grower, you're going to have to pay attention to your markets and market standards. It's a little bit harder. Uh, we don't have the same uh, amount of controls and some of the same broad spectrum controls that a conventional pesticide uh, oriented grower might have. Uh, so we've got to be aware of all these things. It's a whole. All right, next, next slide. All right, 
Prevention beats surprise. Duh. If there is a resistant variety, choose it. If you can rotate, do it. Uh, and build resilience by fostering soil and plant health. So let's talk about this. Let's break this down a little bit. So a resistant variety. I just said there's not a lot of resistant varieties in, in, in uh, fruit or vegetables to insect and mite pests, but there are some. And on my way uh, here from my little farm, I uh, was walking through the orchard and I happened to see one, one of those pests that there is a resistant variety. I don't think you're gonna be able to see this. We'll see how close I can get to the camera. You might be able to see that little woolly, white, fuzzy looking stuff on that twig. It's the woolly apple aphid. And if you didn't know it, you might not even recognize it as an aphid because it has this kind of wool. It's really a wax on it. And uh, you can see it's feeding on a branch. I wouldn't otherwise have seen it because I didn't go digging through my orchard. I was just walking through it. And uh, that's all well and good. I happen to know what it was, but uh, this I'm gonna use this to identify a couple of things I've already talked about. One is the life cycle of the pest. If this is all you saw, you might think, oh, I've got a little aphid problem out there. Do I spray it or not? Mm -hmm. If you knew the life cycle of this pest, you'd know that there's a subterranean form that is underground. There's an underground phase of this pest and that's where it does its real damage. Also, there are rootstocks resistant to that. So if you were buying apples, and especially in the East, but all everywhere really, but <clears throat> all over the United States, but especially in the East where there's a lot of alternate hosts other than apple trees uh, for this woolly apple aphid, you might wanna make sure that you get a woolly apple aphid resistant rootstock. A lot of the dwarf rootstocks are not resistant. Some of the new ones out of Cornell are, but uh, some of them are not. So. This can be a real problem, especially on dwarf rootstocks, and there is resistance. So this is what you'd want to choose for that. So you'd want to know, here's the two principles I want you to understand is that you need to know after you've ID'd this pest, that's important. You need to know what the life cycle is, and then you'd know that there was one underground. Once you start looking up this pest, then you'd see that there might be, in this case, there is a resistant rootstock that you could use. Same thing, by the way, in grapes, Luke, you probably know about the grape phylloxera. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's nodding his head. <laughs> the great phylloxera, if you saw the damage on the leaves, you may not realize that all the real serious damage going on down in the roots. And uh, it's important to recognize, you know, the, uh, the damage on the leaves. Um, but by the way, most American varieties are resistant because it's a North American pest. And you might see damage on the leaves without any damage on the roots. Cynthiana's like that. You'll see all these little pimples on the leaves. No problem. It's because they're really not bothering the roots. All right. I want to talk just a little bit about resilience. It's a, a new buzzword in sustainable ag. I like it. At first, I was just, I'm so tired of new buzzwords. But uh, it, it describes what we want. Uh, there was a long time I probably would have called this tolerance, but it's more than tolerance. So it's not the same as resistance. When we talk about a resistant rootstock or a resistant plant, um, there's things to Paracilla too. There's resistance to Paracilla. That's a serious pest. Um, it's genetic. It's built into the tree. Tolerance and resilience is not. We're just talking about the general health of the tree. Can that tree bounce back or that plant bounce back from damage? That's resilience. Again, I, I used to call it tolerance, but I like it even better to call it resilience. And that's a matter of soil health. You know, if you're doing right, if you're uh, aiming for a good balance in your soil, proper pH, uh, in terms of plant health, then you're going to have resilience in your crops. They're going to bounce back from a little bit of damage. This may not be enough to help your fruit pests, those direct pests, but at least it would help preserve the tree and the overall plant. Okay, so let's move on to the next bullet point, diversity, always. Always keep your, your garden and your orchards and your plantings diverse. Uh, avoid setting the table for pests. 
Um, you could have scale, which is an insect pest. It's very slow moving. And if you planted the same susceptible varieties right next to each other, that scale is going to have a real easy time moving across. So, you know, mix it up. Even though I'm a small orchardist and it's probably not so necessary that I do this, but I still mix up my pawpaws and my apples and my pears. I just scramble it all up, just make it a little bit harder for the pests. This is a little bit more important with diseases, but it's important with insects too. All right, provide habitat for beneficials. For those of us in the Eastern United States, this isn't usually a problem. And what we mean in most cases is flowering plants. A whole lot of our beneficials uh, use flowering plants for pollen and nectar. And um, so here uh, in most of the East United States, all I need to do, all you'd need to do is make sure there's some nice flowering plants, especially those things that have small flowers or in the oh, compositae. Uh, Queen Anne's lace is a good example. Queen Anne's lace is really good for beneficials. Um, oh, there's a ton. But anyway, that's something, if you're out West, and you're farming in some of those irrigated uh, valley uh, farms, you might have to actually grow habitat as part of your farm crop. Uh, we've got a, a fellow on staff here. It's out in the California office. And uh, his brother-in-law is a big time organic tomato producer, you know, 60, 100, 600 acres. I don't know, a lot of acres of tomatoes. And they actually go in and put in rows of woody flowering plants to provide habitat for beneficials. All right, I've already alluded to this several times, but we need to respect this background natural control by not disrupting with broad spectrum organic pesticides. So let's remember that just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's not toxic to something. And most, yeah, I think most organic pesticides that we have access to that are useful, uh, are not broad spectrum. They tend to be narrow spectrum there. But what I mean by broad spectrum is they affect a lot of different insect pests or insects. And this is the important part, not just insect pests, insects. So um, one of the main ones I'm talking here is pyrethrum. Pyrethrum is a neurotoxin. It's produced in the pyrethrum daisy. Um, and it, it affects uh, beneficials and um, pests alike. So be aware that that's the case. Try to avoid using pyrethrum or any of the other real broad spectrum pesticides if you don't need them. Oh, good grief. Okay. Um, be tolerant of indirect or secondary pests. Okay. An indirect pest is one that is not feeding on the fruit directly. <laughs> If it's an apple, a direct pest would affect the apple. If it's a tomato, a direct pest affects the tomato. The indirect pests are the ones that are on the foliage or the woody parts of the plant or some of the stems and things like that. Uh, and you can be tolerant of these indirect or secondary pests like aphids and leafhoppers and even white flies and things like that. Almost always, if you can be patient and tolerant, the beneficials will catch up. So just, just remember that I've hardly ever seen an unsprayed garden where the aphids really become a problem if you can be patient. I'm sure there's some of you that, that would uh, uh, argue with me about that, but I've rarely seen it in my own, I'll put it that way. All right, we already talked a little bit about the economic damage threshold, but one of the main purposes of talking about the economic damage threshold is to realize that for these secondary pests, those things that are feeding only on the foliage, the plant may be able to tolerate a lot of that feeding. Give nature a chance to catch up and do the work for you. You may not have to spray anything. So you're going to have to get out there. If you're not a commercial, if you're a commercial grower, you'll know there's actually even tables. I used to work a lot with mites and apples. We'd count the, the uh, pest mites and we'd count the beneficial mites too. And uh, that, was, that was a real headache work, Luke. <laughs> it was rough. But anyway, you can do that and, uh, and then know that if you see the beneficial mites catching up with the predatory mites, you're probably not gonna have to spray. And you have to understand the economic damage threshold though, in order to make those kind of choices, if you, especially if you're a commercial grower. 
Again, this is not so important to you home growers, but you hopefully understand the principle, it's the same. You can tolerate, you should be able to tolerate uh, some indirect damage to the foliage and stems and things like that. All right, let's move on. All right, talked a little bit about the pest life cycles. Uh, I've talked about the, um, uh, the woolly apple aphid and the grape phylloxera some, but this one's the plum cuculeo. And I noticed that only four or 5% of you said you had a problem with the plum cuculeo. You may not know it. So if you have worms in some large percentage of your apple and you're in the Eastern half of the United States, this is not a pest out West, West of the Rocky Mountains or actually West of the tree line, not a problem at all. But if you're most of the Eastern United States where you can grow apples and you've got worms in your apples, it's probably the larva of this guy. Not a nice fellow. Uh, technically it's a beetle, it's a weevil, but in the order uh, Coleoptera, beetle. Uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to use this one, especially as an example of why the uh, life cycle is important, there's several windows of opportunity where you can impact this pest, but in some cases there's not any. And if you don't understand the life cycle, you could just be um, urinating in the breeze, so to speak, uh, and not doing any good. So I'm going to go over it real quick. The adult is the thing with the long snout there, and it comes in right at after bloom, okay? It's small. It's much smaller than this photo makes it look. And um, I've hardly ever seen one in the wild, and I'm a, I've been a commercial apple grower before. Okay, so it comes in right around bloom time, and it feeds and it lays an egg in the apple. Okay, so immediately this larva is protected from most pesticides and predators. It's protected from beneficials. The plum curculio has inserted its egg inside the apple where it's protected. Now the apple grows for a while. The apple releases, I mean the plum curculio, the larva releases uh, a hormone analog, similar, I call it an analog because it's analogous to the one that's in the apple. This induces the tree to let the apple go, it falls, falls to the ground. The larva exits through the bottom of the apple and starts to pupate in the soil. So when do you have an opportunity to affect this pest? This thing is hidden almost the whole time and it's tiny too. There's ways to get around this, but if you're going out there and you see the feeding damage of the plump cuculeo in June or July, it's too late. It's too late to affect anything by spraying, except maybe disrupt beneficials. You're not going to do any good. Okay. The, one other thing, though, this also, when this provides uh, another weak point of this uh, life cycle, is that when those apples have dropped on the ground, if you pick those apples up regularly, <clears throat> you'll have, you can help reduce that problem over time. One other thing that's not clear from this picture, this old USDA illustration, is that it overwinters in nearby woods. So the old timers used to burn off the woods. They may not even realize that's what they were doing, but they would burn off the woods, the leaf litter and the woods for multiple reasons. And uh, they were killing, they were disrupting the habitat and killing directly the, the overwintering adults. So anyway, these life cycles can be very important. You could be wasting your efforts. Uh, or you could find that uh, weak point too by knowing the life cycle and when to apply some kind of control method. Hope that's understood. Uh, if it's not, we can have some questions. Guy, we've had a couple of questions about if, if plum curculio affects peaches. So if you have yes. moments about that. <laughs> yes, yes, and double yes. It is probably the biggest problem with peaches and it's a double threat because not only does it um, uh, put this worm, quote unquote, in the peach, it is spreading brown rot, which is the bane of organic peach growers. So when it moves from peach to peach, it's a little proboscis there is, is inoculating <laughs> all these peaches with brown rot. So it's a horrible pest for peaches and plums. It's called the plum curculio. Uh, it should be called the fruit, fruit curculio, but it's, a, it's probably the biggest impediment to organic peach growing in the Eastern United States along with brown rot. They kind of go hand in hand, as I just described. I hope that answers there, your question. Yes, is there a predator or um, maybe a 
the natural uh, predator of this type of, of plum curculio? You know, it's this is this is really a tough one. So there are some predators. Uh, some of the old timers, and, and this has been revived, use hogs in orchard to or tillage. You could do tillage and, and accomplish almost the same thing, but to work up that ground under the trees to disrupt the pupil phase. Um, you could also apply beneficial nematodes if you really soak that area right under the tree and do the same thing, affect the pupae. But they have a, a, an amazingly few number of uh, predators and parasites in their above ground phase, in the, in the adult phase. There's really not very many. It's not, there's no birds, there's no specific insect pests. And believe me, I've looked and plenty of other Eastern researchers have looked. There's this weak points, nematodes, hogs. I got to tell you, this is a weird one. Deer, deer, which I've grown to hate, uh, actually affect some biological control by eating all the drops. A drop hits the ground and it doesn't stay there for more than 24 hours before a deer has eaten it. I have fewer plum curculio problems now, uh, much fewer than I did um, oh, 20, 40 years ago when I first started doing this. So there's some weird ones, but not, not, the, not as much as we'd like. So the natural control, I'll just mention real quick, probably the best one is not a predator, parasite, or biocontrol, but it's probably the surround, the surround, uh, which is that kale and clay. You'd want to put it on uh, early, right at petal fall, and uh, you'd probably have to put it on multiple times because it washes off with rain, but it's a very good repellent. I like to say it's the perfect Buddhist pesticide because it's not really a pesticide. It just repels the pests. It's very, very effective if, if you can keep a film of that clay on the trees of fruit. Doesn't hurt the tree and fruit, by the way. Hope that answers the questions. Let's move on. Yep. We've got some more questions about plum curculio management, but I'm thinking we could probably return to this at the end. Yeah. I actually have that listed as the among those fruit pests. So, cool. yeah. All right. I've got a whole lot of text here, so I'll try to zoom through. Um, here's some more important fundamentals to understand about organic pesticides. So they tend to be short-lived. That's good and bad, right? It's good and bad. We don't want them to hang it. We don't want any toxics toxins in our uh, orchard or garden environment. Uh, and most of these organic controls don't last long. Some of them are photodegradable, like uh, the pyrethrum uh, and Bacillus thuringiensis. You know, it's best applied at, at cloudy or, or at dusk. Neurotoxins. We don't have a whole lot of the neurotoxins and organic pesticides. Pyrethrum is one. Uh, this is important stuff, folks. I want you to get this next couple of things, bullet points are really important. They don't have to be ingested. It's real quick knockdown. That's why these pyrethroids, not organic, are used in wasps killers and things like that because they knock the pest down immediately. They work on the nerves. They don't have to be eaten. Uh, it's broad spectrum, so they can uh, hurt beneficials too. Um, but they do work against some really, really otherwise hard to control pests like um, Japanese beetles and squash bugs. Okay, stomach poisons, and this is a lot of our microbials. Uh, a lot of you know Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, spinosad. There's others. They have to be ingested. Okay, the the pest has to eat it. And one of the things that makes squash bugs and tarnished plant bugs and stink bugs difficult, they're true bugs, and they feed. Know your pest. They feed with piercing, sucking mouth parts. They go into the leaf or into the fruit and they may not pick up any or not enough of these stomach poisons to be effective. So you may be, again, not doing any good by putting on some of these stomach poisons against pests that don't eat the leaves, you know, chew on them, ingest them. If they're, po if they're these true bugs, they're really hard to control organically. Um, hormones, neem uh, is basically the, the insecticidal part of neem is really a uh, growth regulators. And one of the things that's important to know then is that it's going to be slow working. You may not immediately realize what's going on, uh, that, it ha that it's working or not. But it usually does stop feeding. Uh, so try to be patient with neem. Uh, let's see. Japanese beetle traps are the same. You have to understand the way these pheromones work and these uh, traps work 
and you're going to have to monitor them. You can't just put them out and think that they're going to do it. You've got to keep uh, keep an eye on them. Beneficial nematodes are talked about a lot. Uh, I use them myself, but remember they're they're tiny little worms. They're yeah. Are they true worms? I think so. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Beneficial nematodes, but they're living organisms. They're tiny and soft-bodied, and they're going to desiccate if you just put them out in the environment. So you can't use them willy-nilly to spray with. But they're really good for some of these soil-dwelling pests, like the grubs of Japanese beetle or the grubs of green June beetle. I use them for um, um, grape root borer and cryptic insects or insects that hide. These are good for borers and things, especially if you can find the, op the tunnel, uh, entrance to the tunnel. You can actually inject beneficial nematodes into uh, peach trees or apple trees where there's borers. Biocontrols, oh, my time is getting used up. I like this so much. Biocontrols, it's for one organism is fighting another. Microbial controls that we mentioned earlier, like BT, that's one form, but the classic biocontrol is one insect against another, like lady beetles and green lacewings. I just want, as, as much as this is important, it's very important. It's most important as background stuff, but there's very few of these that you can release and really get effective biological control, especially if you're buying adults and releasing them because they will just disperse. It's better to preserve environment for them, uh, for these beneficials, like make sure you have you know, some flowering plants, a row of, of uh, undisturbed plants and flowering plants for these beneficials. By the way, green lacewings, if you were to buy one of these generalist predators, the green lacewings are the way to go and get eggs or larvae and not, not the adults. All right, let's go on. Because we are using, we're burning time. Uh, there's some other, especially with organics, these physical controls, they're not, they're not chemically active and they're not biologically active. They're just barriers. So uh, oils and soaps are really are in this care. You won't, may not think of them as that way, but they're barriers. They're usually barriers to the, to the insect pest breathing. Insects breathe through tiny spiracles, just like pores. And if you can cover them up with a, the proper kind of oil, it needs to be the right kind of oil because the wrong kind of oil can damage the foliage of your plant. So but oils and soaps can work. Uh, floating row covers get to be real important with stink bugs and squash bugs. Luke will talk more about that. Uh, hoop houses, uh, especially with screen traps. These are all examples of uh, non-chemically, non-biologically active uh, pest controls. Um, there's the surround again, the kale and clay repellent. It's just a repellent. I wanna mention this again, it's just repellent. It's great stuff. It makes this film on the trees. And uh, I'm not sure anybody knows exactly how it's working, but one of the uh, things that makes sense to me, these clays are silicates. And so they sparkle in the insect eye. Apparently the pests can't even find their host. They have a hard time finding the apples or the peaches. Um, it washes off, so it's not quite a silver bullet. It doesn't work against a few pests like mites. Soaps and oils, kind of mentioned them already, but they're most effective against certain soft-bodied insects and mites. Remember the coverage is important. You're going to have to really, you've got to hit that pest because the soap on the oil just on, a, on the leaf is not going to have any residual effect, right? The bug's not going to get up on that leaf and go, oh, some soap and, and scrub it all around themselves. <laughs> you've got to hit that thing directly. So that's one of the weaknesses. There's no residual effect of these soaps and oils. All right, let's move on. I know I'm really going fast now, folks, but we've got a lot to cover yet. All right. So we talked some about the plum curculio. I wonder what I left out. Uh, let's just move on to the trunk and cane borers. Trunk, the apples, again, a lot of you didn't mention the trunk and, and uh, or trunk borers as a problem in apples, serious problem. And again, a lot of people don't realize that these are a problem. So you're looking at uh, your tree, it just dies. You don't know why you're cussing me. I may be a nurseryman that you bought the tree from. And uh, it, it's, it's a borer that made a tiny little hole when it was little. The beetle actually laid a, an egg in a little crevice. It gets inside the trunk and girdles the trunk by feeding. These are serious problems. And the best thing is exclusion. Put some screen around that trunk. Cane borers and blackberries. Luke knows a lot more about this. But cane borers, if you grow blackberries and raspberries, you'll see these swellings. You need to just cut those out and burn them. Aphids. Gosh, don't worry about the aphids too much. 
just let the lady beetles have a have a feast. If they're really bad, knock them off with with a, a even a stream of water, a hose from your hose, you know. But if you don't otherwise mess with the beneficials, they get taken care of. Codling moth. There's uh, pheromone disruption systems. Uh, by the way, we've got great resources here. All these, like we've got a whole thing. God, I think it's 40 or 50 pages on organic apple production. And it talks about every one of these pests, peach production too, plum and cherry production. We've got all these great publications and you can get all the lowdown on this, on these uh, pests by looking there. June beetles, phew, man, that's a bugaboo. Japanese June beetles, uh, interestingly, you can trap those with buckets of rotten fruit. <laughs> Some of these things are great, and you can have on-farm uh, 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 resolution. You can have on-farm solutions to these problems. Apple maggot and cherry fruit fly, they're going to be a much uh, worse problem up north in New England, and then sometimes, you know, over into in cherry country uh, in northwest. We don't have to worry about them too much. Maybe I'm almost done here because I need to be done, huh? Let's move on. Yeah, um, Guy, before I get started talking okay. about vegetable pests, we did have a few more questions on plum curculio. I think this good. would be a good time to address those. Um, one was on timing of that yeah. soil disturbance, and would chickens do the same thing? Yeah. Would that work? Yes. Yes. So you have to do a lot of chickens, uh, but it does work. Uh, any amount would help. So uh, you might have to give them a head start by kind of tilling up a little bit, getting there with your tiller and kind of chopping it up because if it's already grassy, that the, the larvae is going to go down in that sod and the chicken really can't scratch up sod, but they are significant. Um, it can help. I hope that answers your question, but it's probably, unless you give them some help, the chicken some help by loosening up that soil some, it's probably not going to be enough to affect excellent control. And when's the best timing for that guy? Uh, the chickens is probably best just year round, you know, just give them access, except anytime close to harvest, you don't want to have to be picking up your apples and chicken poop. But other than that, it's good to have yeah. them in there. They'll eat a lot of other pests too, right? They're going to eat a lot of things, stink bugs mm -hmm. that happen to fall from the tree. Yeah. And if you were just using tillage, when would be the ideal time to start tillage? Uh, the ideal time would be uh, after June drop, um, probably like midsummer. Yeah, probably okay. like midsummer, because they're not gonna. They're, the plum curculio adult comes back out in the fall and does a little bit more feeding, and then heads to the woods to overwinter. So that tillage is going to be in the middle. Okay. If you pick up all your drops, or let the deer pick up all the drops, <laughs> you'll help over a period of time with the plum curculio. And then one more question, guy. Um, yeah. Carol Bambeck said she had heard yeah. of planting a wild plum tree as a trap crop for the plum curculio, and you could target treatment on that tree? Would yeah, that well, yeah, okay. Um, it, it, it will definitely attract the plum curculio, and it will definitely build up its population there. Most of the studies I've seen recommend getting rid of those wild plums to not be attracting the plum curculio to your farm at all. Um, I think it'd be tricky using it as a trap crop. It's blooming maybe just a little bit earlier. I'm not sure how well that would work, Carol. Okay. Yeah. And the, again, the professionals, and there's been studies on this, recommend getting rid of all those wild plums if you're going to go low spray or organic because they're, they're just harboring the plum curculio and the brown rot too, by the way. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that answers all the questions we got on Plum Curculio. So I went over a little bit. I apologize, Luke. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> We've got time. Uh, okay. Well, I am going to go ahead and spend the next uh, bit of time, about 20, 30 minutes, talking about fall garden pests. And so I'm going to talk specifically about pests for vegetable crops. I know some of you were asking questions if we were going to talk about vegetable pests. And this is the point in the program we, when we will address those. And then at the very end, once we're done with uh, talking about vegetable pests, we'll have some time for more question and answer. 
answering any questions we didn't address um, up to that point. So again, I've got another uh, poll question for you that I'm gonna launch here. I just wanna get a good sense of which vegetable crops you're having the worst pest pressure on. So lettuce and leafy greens would be one, brassicas would be another, broccoli, cabbage, kale, cauliflower, turnips, uh, squash would be another category. And in this I'm including summer squash, winter squash, and pumpkins. Tomatoes would be another one or other. And you can choose multiple answers here. Just wanna get a sense of which vegetable crops you're having the worst pest pressure on. Let me give it a few more seconds here. Let everybody cast their votes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end it and share results. So it does look like squash is the most problematic for you all, a little over half, but then tomatoes and brassicas are close behind and lettuce and leafy greens. So a lot of you are having a lot of pest pressure on a lot of different crops. Um, squash, squash bugs us usually are the most common, commonly mentioned. Um, and we'll definitely talk about those. All right, so, so talking specifically about, you know, some vegetable crops, I'm really trying to focus on these late summer and fall crops, crops that you'd still have to, in the garden at this point. Um, so lettuce and leafy greens. On, on these crops, which I imagine, you know, any of you doing fall gardening, you've got, you've got lettuce growing right now, you might have some kale, you might have some bro fall broccoli, um, fall cabbage. So on these crops, aphids are, are quite common. Also harlequin bugs, especially in the fall and late summer, um, you'll see a lot of those. That's the, the bug in the middle of the slide, the red and orange pattern, kind of a shield shape. Also caterpillars and loopers, so cabbage worms, cabbage loopers uh, will be common on your brassica crops. Um, so talking more specifically about brassicas, um, those loopers, harlequin bugs, tend to see those more commonly on kale or collards um, and then aphids as well. So similar to your, your leafy greens, similar pests. Um, you know, with your squash, naturally squash bugs, I'm sure all of you had uh, experience with squash bugs this summer. I had an especially bad uh, problem with squash bugs and also squash vine borers on our pumpkin crop in the garden this summer. Uh, cucumber beetles will also show up on, on squash as well. Um, but you know, I'm sure for most of you, it's mainly the squash bugs and then the vine borer, which we'll talk more specifically about those you know, here in, in a few minutes. Um, so when it comes to kind of general management strategies, exclusion is, is really the best strategy when it comes to managing these pests organically. If you can prevent the pests from just getting on the crop in the first place, uh, then you don't have to treat the pest. So row cover and insect netting uh, are fantastic for this. Uh, you know, row cover is great in the spring and fall because it also serve as, serves as frost protection. So you might already have row cover that you're using in the spring for late spring frost, or maybe you, know, you have row cover that you use in the fall to keep the frost off your, your lettuce and other fall crops. So that row cover is a great exclusion for pests. And you know, if you can keep that row cover on without it getting too hot under the row cover, that's a great way to exclude pests. Um, I, I use row cover almost religiously in the spring, especially after transplant planting crops. Eggplant, for example, always has a problem with flea beetle, which chew those little small holes in the leaf of eggplant. And so I will almost always put row cover over my eggplant transplants as soon as I put them out in the garden. And I'll keep it on until the eggplant are, are tall enough and big enough to withstand some damage. So that's a great strategy in the spring and in the fall. For summer, uh, insect netting will allow more airflow and prevent that microclimate under the cover from getting too hot. 
So insect netting, it's, it's a little more expensive, but if you're having problems with summer pests, um, insect netting is a great strategy. So insect netting could be kept on your, on your summer squash, for example, to keep the squash bugs off. Now, one thing to note about exclusion covering your crops is if it's a flowering crop like squash, anything that's gonna set fruit, you need to make sure there's some uh, pollination happening. You need to make sure that those, those pollinating insects are able to get to the flowers to pollinate and uh, allow the crop to produce the fruit. And so in that case with squash, if you're using row cover insect netting, you would need to make sure to take that cover off once they start to flower and allow for pollination. So it's, it's a strategy that will get you so far for most vegetable crops. Um, it's difficult to keep, keep them completely excluded for their entire life cycle, but at least if you can give them a head start, that, that really helps. Good sanitation is really important. So I mentioned that I, I had a problem with squash bugs and vine borers on our pumpkin in the garden. Here's, here's a photo I took just last week. So, you know, what I wanna show you here is that, I mean, if, if this were the middle of the season and I was experiencing this kind of uh, damage from squash bug, I would wanna clean out the vines um, so that the squash bug didn't have that leaf residue to live underneath. Uh, this is kind of what, like what Guy was talking about, cleaning up those apple drops, those drop fruit for plum curculio. For vegetable crops, if you have any kind of foliar damage and you have, or you have dead plants, cleaning those up, getting those out of the garden, either composting them or burning them or, uh, you know, putting them in a, in a hauler far away, uh, you know, that's going to help prevent uh, providing habitat for, for the pests. Um, so good sanitation is just a good, good practice overall, also for diseases as well as insect pests. Okay, so I'm about to start talking about more of the specific pest species, but I wanna launch another poll here to see which pest species you've had the most trouble with. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch this poll. So if you don't mind, uh, could you click the box to, to let me know which insect pest you're experiencing the worst damage from this fall? So we've got aphids, caterpillars and loopers, squash bugs, squash vine borers, tomato fruit worm, tomato hornworm, harlequin bug, or other. And you can check as many of those boxes as you'd like. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a few more seconds on this. Seems like some of you are still clicking away. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results here. Okay, so as I sus suspected, squash bugs are the number one, followed by squash vine borers and then caterpillars and loopers. Um, we've also got quite a bit of tomato hornworm and aphids. That's great. We're going to talk about all of these. Um, very good to know. Okay, so getting into the pest specifically, I know Guy spent some time talking about aphids. Um, here, I'll just add some some other comments. Uh, here's a good photo of what aphids are going to look like on your crop. Uh, for vegetable crops, a lot of times they'll be on the underside of the leaves. Um, and so you might have to spend a little more time, you know, looking uh, to see them. They'll usually be clustered together. A telltale sign of aphids are ants. Um, I'll just throw up this photo here. You'll often find ants where there are aphids because the ants will actually collect the honeydew uh, that the aphids excrete. So it's like a sweet syrup um, that the aphids uh, excrete out of their rear end um, after they feed on the sap of the plant. The, 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 the ants will, will harvest that. They'll use it as food. So often if you see a lot of ants on one of your plants, you'll 
you'll find aphids. They'll lead you to the, the aphids. Uh, but, you know, on that note, um, you might also see mummies. Um, so what you can see here in the photo, those aphids that, um, it looks like they're a hard shell, they're kind of encased in something. Um, those have actually been parasitized by wasps. So there are certain parasitic wasps that will lay eggs in the aphids. And um, so that, that is something to look for. And as, as Guy mentioned, with aphids, a lot of times, uh, you know, if it's out in a garden uh, where you have a good amount of biodiversity, a good amount of, you know, other insect activity, there are a lot of predators of aphids. And so parasitic wasps are one of them. A lot of times you'll see a, a balance um, between aphids and natural predators. You know, you'll also see ladybug larvae feeding on, on aphids or lacewing larvae feeding on aphids. Uh, but if aphids are out of control on, on some of your crops, some of your vegetable crops, um, some organic controls would be um, just a insecticidal soap, which you, you can either purchase or you can, you can make yourself with a, um, an unscented uh, dish detergent, about one teaspoon per gallon of water, or insecticidal oil, horticultural oil, uh, an organic compliant product there is JMS, Stylet oil is a common horticultural oil. Um, you know, some other things to note when it comes to aphids, they will vector viruses. Um, so not only will they directly feed on the leaf, cause you know, shriveling or distortion of the leaves or fruit of your vegetable crops, they can also transmit viruses. Um, and sometimes if, if the problem's not, not too bad, you could just use a you know strong burst of water spray down the plants, especially on on peppers. Um, I tend to see aphids on our peppers every year. Peppers do like a little bit of water on their leaves; they like rainfall. And so spraying down your peppers can knock off the aphids and and at least you know keep them keep them at bay. Where the aphids tend to be worse. Uh, as far as what I've seen, are inside a high tunnel, inside a greenhouse where where it's protected and it's warm. Uh, that's where the aphid populations seem to really build up. Okay, caterpillars and loopers. You know, a lot of you said you were having problems with these this year. You know, the good thing about caterpillars and loopers are that uh, they're fairly easy to control organically. So. A telltale sign of caterpillars and loopers you know, on your brassicas, your kale, your cabbage, um, your collards are you know, those feeding holes. They'll be pretty obvious, those feeding holes. Um, you'll also see, I mean, especially in the summertime, these white cabbage, white butterflies, um, which will lay the eggs, which will then um, lead to the the cabbage looper. Um, when it comes to organic controls, you know, if you don't have very many, you can simply pick them off and squish them. They make great food for chickens if you have chickens. Uh, but when it comes to a spray, BT, which Guy mentioned, Bacillus thuringiensis, is a very targeted, um, non-toxic organic spray that is very effective against cabbage worms and cabbage loopers. It's actually residual. So, you know, if you spray your plant leaf, you don't have to hit the, the worm directly. It's when the worm feeds on a leaf that has some of that BT residue, it will disrupt um, their stomach, prevent them from feeding. And so BT is, is really the, the best way to go when it comes to that. Um, another organic material is spinosad. Um, which is also very effective. And when it comes to these, row cover um, can be effective at least to keep the, the moth from laying the eggs to prevent those, 
those loopers or cabbage worms from actually hatching and, and feeding on your leaves. So, you know, as, as much as you can, using row cover in the spring uh, can help prevent them from even becoming a problem in the first place. Okay, so now everybody's favorite, the squash bug, <laughs> which, sorry, I've got no, no silver bullets here. This is a very problematic pest for organic growers. Um, you know, everything from summer squash, winter squash, pumpkins, um, the squash bug is just, you know, perennially terrible. Um, so as Guy mentioned, they have piercing sucking mouth parts, um, similar to stink bug. When it comes to damage, um, they'll, they'll vector viruses also lead to discolored spotting on the leaves of your squash and then eventual wilting of the leaves. So control, as I mentioned before, row cover or insect netting really is the best preventative when it comes to keeping squash bugs off your plants. Um, on this slide here, I have a photo of the eggs, which you know, are very distinct. The thing is they're gonna be on the underside of the leaves. So you do need to check your plants regularly. Every few days, look under the leaves to see if there are any eggs. When you do see eggs, you can rub them off. So if you have, if you have a garden and you know, just a few squash plants, this can be an effective way to keep them under control at least for a little bit is to regularly check your plants and rub off any eggs. Now, eventually um, they're gonna, they're gonna get out from under you. And um, you know, at, at that point, hand picking is an option. If you don't have too many, picking the squash bugs off, you can kill them by just dropping them in a bucket of soapy water or squishing them by hand. Um, you know, a way to actually trap them would be to put boards like a, a two by four or just other scrap lumber around your squash plants. They like to, to congregate under that. Um, so that's a way to trap them in one place and then you can effectively squish them or, or pick them at that point. Uh, you know, cleaning crop debris, which I mentioned before, um, so they don't have many places to hide. Uh, this is one case where organic mulch, like if you use straw mulch, uh, this can actually make the squash bug problem worse because that straw mulch is going to give them a place to hide. Um, so under your squash, if you could use landscape fabric, um, which you saw a photo of that in my garden, or bare soil, it's easier to, to see them. You know, naturally that's not foolproof. Um, you know, when it comes to sprays, insecticidal soap can work on the nymphs, which are the immature squash bugs, which you can see in this photo on the right, the really small ones, you can use insecticidal soap. They have a softer body, uh, which is susceptible to damage from soap. When it comes to the adults, because of that hard exoskeleton, really one of the only organic sprays is pyganic, which Guy mentioned. So pyganic is, uh, you know, one of the, the heaviest hammers when it comes to organic controls. You have to be careful because it's it's broad, broad spectrum and, you know, it can also damage your pollinating insects like honeybees. Um, and it, it is a, expensive, but if, if you need something to control adult squash bugs, pyganic is an effective organic control at that point. Luke, we've had so, a couple of questions come in about squash bugs. I want to get in real fast. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So one question, should we avoid cardboard and hay around squash? You mentioned, you know, straw could, could harbor them. Yes. In the same way, they would love to live under the, the hay or the cardboard. So I would avoid that. Yeah. And another question was, about um, composting the leaf litter, like you mentioned earlier, and cleaning up that debris. And if you compost it, will that stop the life cycle or will the squash bugs or squash vine borers survive that composting? That should effectively end the life cycle, you know, especially if you have a, a large enough compost pile and you're actually able to reach those, those thermophilic temperatures over 130 degrees and, and you're turning it and incorporating it, that would effectively um, you know, kill any 
immature stages or, or eggs and break the life cycle. But if you have a more um, passive compost pile, it's just a kind of a pile of vegetable scraps and it, it doesn't really get very hot, I would not put any, any plant residue that might be you know, infested in that compost. And then I would discard of it in, in a better way. So burning it or throwing it away, something like that. Does that answer all the squash bug questions, Margo? Yes, we've got several of other questions, but I'll leave them to, to the end. Those were specific <laughs> to squash bugs. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I'm just noticing real quick, someone's saying a Black & Decker vacuum. I imagine they're saying a shop vac works well on the squash bugs, which uh, that's something I'm going to mention when it comes to uh, blister beetles. And so, yeah, a bug vacuum can be effective. Uh, I'll talk about that more with blister beetles. So squash vine borer is very pernicious. A lot of times you don't realize you have vine borers until your, your pumpkin vines or your winter squash vines just start dying. And lo and behold, you look at the stem and there's you know a little larva that had burrowed into the base of the stem and hollowed out the inside of the stem and killed your plant. So with squash vine borer, um, just briefly, the life cycle is that um, after mating, um, the adult will lay an egg at the base of the plant, the egg will hatch, and then the larva will burrow into the stem. And like I was talking about with plum curculio, because of the life cycle, most of the time the pest is hidden until it's too late and it's killed your squash plant or your pumpkin plant. You can be diligent and you know, look for any sign of feeding at the base of the stem. Uh, look for any of frass, which is the larval poop, um, or any holes in the stem. And if you catch it early, you could actually cut out the larva. This is difficult and a delicate process. Uh, it is possible theoretically. Another thing you can do if, if you're on a garden scale, just with a few plants, is actually make collars out of tinfoil around the base of the stem to prevent the adults from laying eggs and prevent that larva from burrowing into the stem. So that would be a preventative measure there. Row cover as well, keeping that row cover on as long as you can um, to prevent the, the eggs from being laid on the stem of your squash plants. Um, that, that's, really, that's really all you got when it comes to organic management of the squash vine borer. Um, this one's quite, quite difficult. And the issue with sprays is that that larva is inside the stem. So any kind of spray, uh, like for example, a BT spray is, is not really going to get in there for that larva to feed on. Okay, tomato fruitworm, um, another larva, which means that it is susceptible to BT. When it comes to tomato fruitworm, and then we're going to talk about the hornworm here in a minute. Um, BT is, is really the best control measure here. So a lot of you uh, who are growing tomatoes have probably seen fruit with these with holes in them. Usually they'll be the first fruit to ripen, um, which is exciting. You think you have ripe fruit, but then lo and behold, it's ripened because it has feeding damage from a tomato fruit worm. Might even have a worm in it. Um, and so the damage is very obvious on the fruit. Fortunately, just making frequent applications of BT, especially reapplying anytime it rains, so that you you cover your you know immature green tomato fruit with that BT, um, so that any larval feeding will result in in the death of those fruit worms. That really is the best control of this pest. Um, hand picking can be effective to some degree, but really I. I just try to keep our tomato plants sprayed with BT um, about you know once a week, spraying the plants um, unless it it rains and after a rain I would spray BT again, just keeping those fruit covered. Um, same thing with tomato hornworm though, you know these these caterpillars are so big, uh, usually there aren't too many of them in the garden that hand picking. Uh, can be a very effective strategy for these guys. The telltale sign for the tomato hornworm 
is their frass, their poop, which to me, it looks like little grenades. Uh, you can see that on the slide, the bottom right hand photo. You know, if you see this, look up, you know, it's, it's usually just a few leaves above where the droppings are. Um, so hand picking is very effective. Also something to note, there are parasitic wasps, which will, will lay eggs on the tomato hornworm, which you can see in the photo in the, the bottom left. Hand corner of this slide, uh, there's that hornworm covered in wasp eggs. Uh, so that, that's pretty cool to see and that, that can happen. Um, but one way to just prevent the damage before it happens is keeping your tomatoes sprayed with BT. Um, so that will be effective, you know, if they feed on that BT residue. Harlequin bug, you know, you've seen a photo of this before. Um, this one as a, as a true bug, you know, with that hard exoskeleton is, is difficult to control. Um, picking, you know, hand picking um, can be effective on these guys, dropping them in a bucket of soapy water. Um, also row cover to keep them off your, your crops. And in the fall, it's mainly those leafy crops like kale, Swiss chard, um, which they seem to do the worst damage on. Dusting those crops with diatomaceous earth can help um, and can irritate the harlequin bugs, prevent them from feeding. And then when it comes to sprays, Pyganic is really um, one of the only effective organic sprays for these guys. You know, one thing you can look for are those eggs, which you can see in the photo here. Um, they have that interesting um, yellow and black stripe pattern. So if you see those eggs, you can destroy them, which will prevent them from being being hatched. Okay, blister beetles. Um, actually, someone had, had reached out to me earlier, just making sure we'd talk about blister beetles. Um, so I wanted to, to be sure to cover it. Blister beetles are, are kind of a phenomenon. Um, you might go years without having any problem from blister beetles, and then one year they just devastate your garden. Um, you know, they're swarming, and so they can do a lot of damage all at once, almost like a plague of locusts. Um, I think it was David Mervis was telling me that uh, they just made his potato plants disappear this year. It's really amazing how much damage they can do. Um, with these, you know, I mentioned a bug vacuum. Um, when I was at the Kerr Center in Oklahoma, we experimented with using a leaf blower uh, in reverse. So it was actually sucking and sucking up blister beetles. We had a big problem on sweet potatoes with blister beetles, sucking them up um, into a bag. That, that can work. Or, you know, if you have a shop vac, you can vacuum them up. Um, besides that, Pyganic is an effective spray. Um, but if it's, if you're dealing with a garden, I would, I would maybe even just buy, you know, a a shop back for for the occasion, because um, usually you'll have you'll have hundreds at a time. I mean, they just swarm, um, and it's very important to to control them when you have them because they can cause a lot of devastation in your garden. You know, one thing to note: you want to avoid touching them. They can actually irritate your skin, which is why they're called blister beetles. Um, but something to keep an eye out for. Okay, so that was an overview of some common fall garden pests. Um, I know we're just scratching the surface. There are so many insect pests out there that you have to deal with. Um, but fortunately, um, we have a great resource on our ATRA website. Um, it's called the Biorational Ecological Pest Management Database, which uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Rex DeFore, put together years ago. And it is, it is a database that is incredibly comprehensive and lists con controls, organic controls for really any insect pests, uh, mites, or disease out there. Um, you know, the biggest thing is once you can identify the pest, this bio biorational database is a great place to, to see what organic controls are available, uh, what commercial products there are, and how effective those controls are. Um, in addition to listing the controls, it also will give you um, some other tips on scouting and trapping 
and management practices. So this is really, this should be your go-to when it comes to finding out how to manage pests organically. When it comes to identifying the pest, there are a lot of good books out there, um, but you know, now that, uh, you know, we all have smartphones and, um, you know, use our smartphones for everything else. There are pest ID apps for the smartphone. Um, I actually asked our state um, IPM specialist about some that he he's used and would recommend. Um, and my IPM, he said was a great one for um, management practices for pests. Um, and then when it comes to actually identifying the insect pest, Seek by iNaturalist is, is a good one. But you can always check the, the App Store or the Google Play Store and see, see what other apps are available. But um, this is something that it can be a, a really handy way for you to be able to identify those pests out in the field. All right, so um, I've got two more evaluation questions for you all um, before we go into question and answer. Um, if you wouldn't mind answering these for us real quick, it just gives us a sense of how we did today. Um, so I'm gonna launch this poll. If you wouldn't mind taking a second and tell us how would you rank the usefulness of what you learned in this workshop? So just give us a, a good sense of, of how we did. I'm gonna be following up with an email with the slides. So you'll have the slides as a reference. We also have a resources list that I'll be sending you. And then once we make the recording of this webinar live and we post it to our YouTube channel, I will share that link with all of you as well. And I'm gonna keep these answers anonymous, uh, but we just wanna capture some feedback while you guys are all with us. All right, and then I have one more question for you all. And the question is, do you plan to make changes to your production based on what you learned. So even if you're, if you're a garden, gardener or a commercial farmer, do you plan to implement any of the practices that either Guy or myself talked about today? If you wouldn't mind taking a minute and answering that, uh, we'd really appreciate it. All right, well, thank you all for staying with us this hour and a half. Um, so Guy and I have you know, a few minutes here at the end to answer some questions we weren't able to get to uh, during this webinar. It looks like we probably have some in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Before we get to those, I just wanna quickly say, um, we have our email addresses here on this slide. You know, feel free to contact us directly if you have, you know, a question about pest management. Um, this, is, this is why we're here. This is what the ATRA program is for is to assist growers like you. So we'd be happy to help provide one-on-one -on -one assistance. Um, that's one thing we're, we're paid to do. And in addition to email, we also have a, a hotline where you can talk to an after specialist and the number is there on the screen. All right, well, Margo, do we have any? Yeah. Yeah, questions? so there's there's been a lot of questions and discussion, which I, I love, but a couple of questions that have been repeated by more than one person. So I'll make sure and get these in. Um, the first question was a, a pest or something that's eating all the seedlings of germinating greens. And so wondering what pest that might be. Oh, good question. That is probably a cutworm, uh, which would live in the soil. Uh, considering it's a worm, it's a larva, Bt would be effective, but um, you know you might not be able to get good coverage on your seedlings uh, with Bt. One thing I would do is you know make sure there's not any crop residue that those cutworms are hiding underneath. Um, and it, if it is a problem, you can you can be sure to spray you know around those seedlings with Bt, make sure the Bt's on the stem. So if the cutworm does feed on it, um, it'll ingest that BT and die. Um, but that's most likely what it is, a cutworm. Guy, anything to add there? Oh, armyworm, but the same thing. Oh, armyworm is a possibility. Yeah. You usually see them because they're usually in large numbers. <laughs> yeah. The okay. same controls. 
another question and we had quite a bit of um discussion and idea sharing in the chat so thankful for that for those of you who chimed in but a question about fire ants and fire ants causing problems in the garden and taking over um if you have any recommendations uh a little bit different. Uh, okay. Move to the Ozarks. Move, move. <laughs> uh, actually, the nematodes. Nematodes, uh, the right species, and I can't remember Steiner Nema. I can't remember which one, but we could find out for you. But uh, nematodes are a great way uh, to deal with fire ants. Yeah, and I know when I was in Oklahoma at the Kerr Center, we had a lot of fire ants, pretty bad. And there are do? some. Forget the active ingredient, but there's a bait. Um, so and probably it is boric a acid. Control probably boric a, acid, wouldn't of, it? It's a granular product um, with a biological control, and the fire ants will take it back to the nest, and it'll infect the the colony. Huh. I'm not sure what the active ingredient is. But we can follow up with those of you yeah. fire ant question. Yeah. Do you have a book or two for pest ID that you would recommend having on hand? Hmm. You know, uh, I noticed uh, we were both using some things from Bugwood. Now that's a yeah. site, that's a, 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 a IPM site out of University of Georgia. Uh, and that's open to the public, I believe. I don't think I've ever had trouble yes. accessing it. Uh, that's not a book, books. What are books again? There, <laughs> I have tons of old books at home, but I couldn't pick out any one. Yeah, there's a book. Oh, okay. Here, here's one that's highly recommended. It's called Garden Insects of North America, yeah. the Ultimate Guide to Backyard Bugs. So Garden Insects of North America is a book I would recommend. Great color photos, great for ID. Um, I mean, this has to do more with, with vegetable pests, but that would be the one I recommend. In the fruit business, there are so many pests. I usually go to uh, the University of California has a series on pests of apples, peaches, figs, you know, whatever. And uh, there's a few others few other universities that have that too. Oh, oh, the American Phytopathological Society. But anyway, uh, I go to the commodity. I would look for pests of apple. And that's mostly because, you know, apples will have so many pests, you know, 50 or more serious pests. So I look for apples first and then one of, you know, what are the pests on apples? Either a website or a book, either one. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll ask one more question and just so everyone knows we have the chat saved so we will go back through and make sure that we have addressed everyone's question and so you might get a follow up email or we might be able to include it with the follow up um, the follow up email with the resources and and slides. Um, so even if we don't answer it right here, we will make sure and get your question answered and um, the last question. Are biodisruptors like BT safe if beneficial pollinator larvae are exposed? Only if those pollinator larvae are lepidopterans, then it could be. Uh, so if you have, I can't think of any beneficial lepidopterans. I mean, other than pollinator. Well, that pollinator is yeah. pretty important. What about monarchs? monarchs yeah, BT flies? would affect it. If it would affect uh, the larvae. So BT, if y'all don't already know, is is um, restricted its usefulness is restricted to lepidopterans that is butterflies moths it's not going to affect the larvae phase of a lot of other beneficials you know uh ladybugs and green lace wings and things like that but it could definitely affect some of these pollinators um yeah hmm. it's an issue i suppose i, I don't it's possible yeah and i i will add that so you know, if you're worried about moths and butterflies, you know those beneficials, the larva would have to feed on the crop that you're spraying the right. BT on. And so you know, it, it can kill that larva, but there are enough, you know, there's enough wild habitat for those uh, you know, beneficial moths and butterflies that um, you know, they, they should still have refuge and, and you wouldn't look at disrupting the entire population. 
There might be some collateral damage, though, unfortunately. Okay. Um, well, like Margo said, we will follow up uh, for those of you who left questions in the chat that we weren't able to get through. We will we'll comb the, the saved chat and find any questions we couldn't answer. And again, I'm going to be following up with all of you um, with these slides and then our resource page. And feel free to contact either Guy or myself with any other questions. We really appreciate you all joining us this evening. It was really a pleasure uh, spending time with you and talking about pests. Uh, again, thanks so much. And you all have a great evening. <laughs>